Euzubillahimineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve la akibetü lil muttakin ve la udvane illa alal zalimin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala rasulina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmain. Ve men tabi'ahu bi ihsan ila yevmiddin. Subhaneke la ilme lana illa ma'allemtena inneke entel alimul hakim. Subhaneke la fahme lana illa ma fahamtena inneke entel cevvadul kerim. Rabbi şrah li sadri ve yassir li emri. Vahlul uqdeten min lisani yafqahu qawli. Ve ufavvidu emri ila Allah. İnne Allah'a basirun bil ibad. Allahümme salli salaten kamileten ve sellem selamen tamme. Ala seyyidina Muhammedin illezî tenhallu bihil uqad. Ve tenfericu bihil kurab. Ve tuqta bihil havaicu ve tunalu bihil ragaib. Ve husnul khawatim. Ve yustesqal ghamamu bi vecihil kerim. Ala alihi ve sahbihi fi kulli lemhatin. Ve nefesin bi adedi kulli malumin lak. Allahümme inna nes'eluke. الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى اللهم إنا نسألك عفو والعافية في الدين والدنيا والآخرة توفنا مسلما والحقنا بالصالحين اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا ولسانا ذاكرا وشاكرا وتوبة نصوحا رب يسر ولا تعسر رب تمم بالخير رب زدني علما وفهما والحقنا بالصالحين اللهم اجعلنا من التوابين واجعلنا من المتطهرين واجعلنا من عبادك الصالحين واجعلنا من الذين لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My respected brothers and very respected sisters and everybody who is watching us the families brothers in Sydney and others. Jazakumullahu khairul jaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you with the best of rewards for joining us this evening at the Coburg Islamic Center for our Friday night usra. We want to talk about inshallah tonight some very important points that I've selected. I want to introduce to you this beautiful deen of ours. The concept of religion in the West and sometimes amongst the Muslims understood something that is personal between you and what you believe in, whatever that is. In Islam, this is not so. In Islam, it is definitely personal, but it is definitely at the same time covers every aspect of human existence. There is nothing left unturned, no sto stone unturned in human existence where you would not find Islam. Everywhere. This is the way a Muslim should look at Islam. There is no separation between laity and clergy, so to speak. Mundane and profound. Personal and social. Business or ibadah, worship. Everything interlaced. Bound intricately. Interwoven together. And looked after. Cared for. For the benefit of the individual the family, and the society, and the humanity at large. Everything is related to one another. Everything in Islam has two dimensions, external and internal, khalq and khuluq, if you like, form and substance, spiritual and material, esoteric or exoteric, physical, and the metaphysical, the action or the inaction, and the intentions behind them. Everything has two aspects, dunya and akhirah. Whatever you do here has definite and ultimate implications and repercussions for the hereafter. 
Everything is interlinked. Nothing is missed out. Not a single gesture. Not a single smile. Not a single frowning. Everything is recorded. Whether you do it openly or secretly, whatever it is in your heart or in your actions, everything is recorded and everything is regulated. Islam covers every aspect of human question. Every interaction, every action or inaction is recorded. Rewarded or punished. Very simple equation Islam has for the human question, for our existence. As a human being, you choose a lifestyle, complete freedom given to you. You choose a lifestyle in this world. That lifestyle will have a binary outcome in the hereafter. What is that binary outcome? As we know, majority of young people, zero, one, on and off. The binary outcome in the hereafter is either Jannah or Jahannam. There is nothing in between. That all depends on how you live in this life here. What kind of lifestyle you have chosen for yourself to live. It's entirely up to you. You're free to do anything you want. Either path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or part of shaitan. You either worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you worship shaitan, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Nothing in between. But everything is interlinked. You cannot divorce the deen from your social life, your personal life, your personal thinking. Mm -mm. Society, family, every decision that you have to make has to go through to the membrane that that filter of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the simple understanding of that religion is something personal is completely out the window, has no value in the sight of Islam. Everything is Islam. Everything from ecology to geography to maths, science, sociology, everything is Islam. Islam interferes with everything, regulates with everything. Islam wants us to have a consequential thinking. Everything has a consequence. Whatever you do. Second law of physics, Newton's law, what was it again? Every action has equal and opposite reaction. Everything that you do in Islam has a consequence for the hereafter. Everything. That's why we have these classifications, fard, wajib, sunnah, haram, makruh. All these classifications to guide you. Af'al al-mukallafin. The doings, the actions of a mukallaf person. As soon as you hit the age of puberty, you're sane and you're a Muslim, <laughs> it's started. Whether you like it or not, whether you ignore it or not, it is there. Whether you believe that air exists or not, the sun exists or not, it's irrelevant, still there. But you will be questioned for on the Day of Judgment. One day, Jibreel alayhi salam appeared before Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And he said, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Aish ma shi'at, fa innaka mayyit. First reality, live as much as you want, you wish, you will, you must definitely realize that you shall definitely taste death. This is the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul maut. Every soul who came to this world, every day, close to half a million people are born, every day, and close to that number, a bit less, is passed on to the next world. They have tasted the death. Today, half a million people in the world, constantly. There is no escape. So, live as much as you want, he says, the reality that you shall one day die and stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, وَأَحْبِئْ مَنْ شِئْتْ فَإِنَّكَ 
مفارقه. Go and live. Your heart, give your heart to anything you want. Make any choice that you want. Fall in love with anything. Let حب الدنيا come into your heart and live in your heart. Or loves that you, you the love that you're supposed to extend to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only and everything that He approves. You give that heart to materialist things, materialistic things. One day you shall be separated from it. Whatever the case is. And thirdly, he says, وَعْمَلْ مَا شِئْتْ فَإِنَّكَ مَجْزِيٌ بِهِ Go and do anything you want. Any choice, any amal, any action you do. Work, no work, do, no do. Just do it or just no do it. Entirely up to you. You shall be questioned for it. For your action as well as for your inaction. For your proactiveness as well as your negligence, indifference in everything that you do in life. Until you breathe your last, you are under exam conditions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. Malaika recording everything. Whether you hide things or you make it obvious, clear, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. This is the reality of a Muslim. So at the end of this equation in the hereafter, you will either have akhirah, in akhirah, in jannah, eternally, or jahannam. Up to you. So tonight, inshallah, I want to present to you a bouquet of sayings of our beloved Mustafa sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam that will inshallah guide us in many aspects of our lives. Everybody tonight will get something out of tonight's lecture, inshallah. And their nasib, according to their inner depth and their mindset, the way they look at Islam. But I want to start with the most important topic, which in this day and age, every man is an island. They don't care about anybody. It's disgusting. I feel like vomiting. When I see some series on television, people have lost morality completely. Everybody's so selfish. Nobody cares for anything. Everybody wants their way. They don't care about their parents. They don't care about their children. They don't care about wife or husband. Nothing. Grandparents, nothing. Everybody's amazing. So selfish, so self-centered. Muslims are becoming like that. Our young generations are becoming like this. We have lost our respect for other. We have lost our respect for our elders. We don't love our youngsters. We don't care about our parents. We don't care about our brothers and sisters in the world, anywhere in the world, including our Muslim neighbors around. We have lost the plot, some of us. The first foundation of any Muslim community. If there is Islam, you would find compassion. You would find sacrifice. You would find trust. You would find muhabba, love. If these do not exist amongst the Muslim community, that Muslim community is no Muslim community. They carry the labels, but they're all empty vessels. Their hearts are empty. Their hearts are sick. Absolutely sick. Their nafsul ammar is in full control. Shaitan has full grip on them that they cannot let go. Sacrifice. Muhabba towards one another. Caring for one another. Muhabba, love towards one another is so important in our deen. I want to, inshallah ta'ala, concentrate tonight on this particular topic. Maybe I can ignite certain things within you. Maybe you will stop thinking so selfishly about yourself and your needs more than anybody else. Let's see. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in one Sahih Hadith that we always mention. وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَا تَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَا تُؤْمِنُوا حَتَّى تَحَابُوا أَلَا أُخْبِرُكُمْ Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, None of you shall enter paradise, Jannah, without Iman. Impossible for a kafir to enter into Jannah. 
No matter how good they are, externally, in this life, because their inner stings, as far as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is concerned. It's rotten, najis. Therefore, they will never enter Jannah. It says, none of you can enter, can enter Jannah without Iman. But none of you will be regarded as a person having Iman, a mu'min, a believer, until you love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shall I tell you, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, some, something that will increase their love amongst you. If sha'u salam, give salams to one another. Give salams to one another. We need to visit one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the igniters of this muhabba in the community is visiting one another. When a person visits one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in hadith Qudsi, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, using the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, حَقَّتْ مُحَبَّتِي لِلْمُتَزَاوِرِينَ It that, that person who goes and visits a fellow Muslim for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only, no other reason, makes an effort to go and knock on the door. I am not talking about Facebook visits. I'm not talking about virtual visits. I am talking about person-to-person -person visits. I will tell you more about it in a minute. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that person earns the right to be loved by me. Earns the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, earns the right to be loved by me. He has, he has the haqq of being loved by me. When you go and visit somebody for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us. So muhabba within our deen is so important. And this muhabba has to be from the heart has to be without any strings attached. I want to go and see him because I'm interested in his daughter. That is not, that's strings attached. I want to go and visit him because I want my iPhone to be fixed. That's strings attached. I want to go and visit him because he owes me some money, I'll remind him, hint to him. Uh -uh. I want to go and see him because his mother makes good curry. These are all strings attached. It has to be purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing else. You need to assist and come to the aid of a Muslim brother of yours. You need to come to the aid of a Muslim brother or sister of yours when they're in need. Look what our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says in a hadith narrated by Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. Qala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. مَنْ أَعَانَ مُسْلِمًا بِكَلِمَةٍ أَوْ مَشَى لَهُ خَطْوَةً حَشَرَهُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ مَعَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَالرُّسُلِ آمِنًا وَأَعْطَاهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ أَجْرَ سَبْعِينَ شَهِيدًا قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ سبحان الله Amazing He who helps a fellow Muslim even as much as with a single word. Yes, no problem. <laughs> Inshallah. One word. How are you? Just a gentle one word. Or take a single step to assist a fellow Muslim. Make a sacrifice. How much? One step. Well, what's one step going to do? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uses this expression. One word sometimes can start a war sometimes can bring eternal peace. One word, the kalima la ilaha illallah, can put into jannah. One step towards the right, one step, or step towards helping a Muslim. What will happen to such a Muslim? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment will resurrect that particular person who made one little word or one step towards helping a fellow Muslim. Allah will resurrect that person amongst the prophets and the messengers. Aminan, as protected, as safe. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bestow upon that particular person the status of 70 shaheeds who died in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When was the last time you ever did anything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
When did you ever come to the help and aid of a fellow Muslim? Did you avoid the Muslims because I hate Muslims? Is that how you treat Muslims? Another hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Man a'ana mu'minan ala hajatihi wahab Allahu lahu thalathatan wa sab'ina rahmatan yuslihu Allahu lahu dunyahu wa akhara lahu ithnayn wa sab'ina rahmatan madkhuratan fi darajat al-jannah Subhanallah In this hadith, not a Muslim but it says mu'min, a believer he who comes to the aid of a Muslim who is in need of something, comes to help, assist the Muslim, ala hajatihi. When a Muslim needs something, needs something, and you have fulfilled that need of that Muslim. They're hungry, you fed him, gave him money, okay. They need to buy some clothing for their children. You bought them. Any act of kindness, but they need it. You come in aid of the Muslim's need. What will happen to you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately will give you his mercy. How much? 73. Rahmah, mercy will come upon you. When Rahmah covers you, you're covered. Full insurance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he says, Yusluhu Allahu lahu dunyahu. Only one of them out of the 73 will be enough to take care of all your affairs and concerns and problems in this world. One of them. The other 72. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will vouchsafe it for you. In Jannah, madkhuratan, He'll keep it for you. He'll hide it for you. He'll protect it for you. And will give you as a bonus. In Jannah, when you get it, fi darajat al Jannah. For that, so that you can go high as possible in the Jannah. In paradise. There are so many gates, so many different levels in Jannah. Like dunya, there's a state. But Jannatul Firdaus al-A'la is the highest. So when you come to the aid of a fellow Muslim, just fulfill one of his needs, what will happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you 73 rahmah, mercies. One of them is enough for you, the rest will be kept for you, for Jannah. Subhanallah. This is the warning. If a person does not take care of the affairs of Muslims, pay attention to ihtimam. Pay attention to be vigilant with the affairs of Muslims when they need something, when they need your help. He is not one of them. So our Islam has to be Live, dynamic. Our Islam has to be proactive, not passive Muslim. Not selfish Muslim. Not ghafil Muslim. Not indifferent Muslim. Not none of my business Muslim. Not I am only concerned about myself, I don't care about anybody Muslim. In a different hadith I remember, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says, when a Muslim is put in the qubur, in the qabr, in the grave, before even the malakul maut, before the uh, munkar and nakir, the uh, angels of questioning come, he says, an angel, two angels, three angels will be waiting for him. As soon as he gets in, with a maze in their hands, they hit him so badly. Really, he sinks so deep on earth. And he screams, he says, what are you hitting me? I'm a Muslim, I'm a Mu'min, I'm a believer, what are you doing? I didn't do anything. When he comes up, he says, why are you hitting me? You got the mistaken identity. I'm a good Muslim, I'm a muttaqi Muslim. I'm an abid Muslim, I went to Hajj 20 times. They say, you know what this is for? They said, no, he says, no. 
What is it for? He says, this is one time the honor, dignity, sheriff of a Muslim was being usurped, cheated in front of you and you had the say in it. You could have prevented it. You could have come to the help of that need of that Muslim, but you just walked away. This is the punishment for it. When a Muslim assists in the shopping center, she's muhajiba with a child, children, walking into the supermarket, some hooligan, some idiot, attacks her, swears at her, and you as a Muslim, Stand by and don't do anything. Even worse, you walk away because you don't want to get into trouble with the law. Ha uh ha, -huh. you shall be amongst those people. Being a Muslim is the greatest gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to fulfill your obligations towards your community. Relationships. Everything in Islam, but it starts with muhabba. Caring for others. Without this care, you cannot love your parents. There won't be any salatul rahim. There won't be any respect for others because you're selfish, you missed, your heart is sick. If a person believes in Allah, fears Allah, claims to have love of Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in his heart, if he say that he is the umm of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has to be an active Muslim, dynamic Muslim, versatile Muslim, vigilant Muslim. He needs to be actively taking part in the community projects, in the society, with the community. If your life is on a routine, then you go to work, come back home, watch television, have dinner, sleep. Wake up, go to work, go to the bank and pay the loan in the house, come back, watch television or internet, go to sleep. If, and you're, you're looking for the weekend, in your weekend you sleep, sleep, sleep, watch a couple more movies, and Monday again, and you call yourself a Muslim, you're mistaken. This is not a true Muslim. This is not a Mu'min Kamil. You need to be active in your society. If you call yourself a Salih Muslim, you call yourself a Sadiq Muslim, if you call yourself a righteous Muslim, Muttaqi Muslim, you have obligations, duties towards the society. The neglect, the negligence of the Salihin will make or give room for the Fasiqin to become dominant in the society. This is the Sunnatullah. You neglect your duty, Allah will bring the fasiqeen to dominate over you. The condition of Muslim Ummah in every Muslim country is this equation. Because Salihin did not, do their, did not do their job within the community. Therefore the fasiqeen, fajireen, kafireen, munafiqeen came and their tasallut, their sulta, their control over the Muslims. Syria. 85% Sunni Muslims under subjugation, un under torture of less than 10% of Valimin. Nusayri Valimin. How? How could this be so? 85% of the people, if they just spit on them, they'll drown them with their spits. Uh -uh. Because Muslim says, none of my business, I'm scared. Whether you're afraid or not, it's not going to change your time of your death, your ajal. You either die with sharaf or with disgrace, both in this world and the hereafter. But you stand up for your Muslim brethren. You stand up for haq and truth at all times. Be on the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be against the enemies of God. As simple as this, your choice, in any given society. We are Muslims, alhamdulillah. When we interact with one another based on muhabba, love, warm relations, 
Fascinating. What will happen? Can you imagine a society? How Ashab Kiram, Radwanullahi Ta'ala alayhi majma'in, were always like that with Muhammad. No racism, no asabiyya, no partisanship, no tribalism. There is always love, respect to one and towards one another. As long as you're Muslim, the sharaf comes to you because of your Islam. Sharaf comes to you in the sight of Allah because of your iman. And that iman can never be compared to anything. Therefore, you have rights on me. I have to fulfill those rights. You have ju- I have duties upon you that I must fulfill those duties. Yes, you could be in the form of my wife. You could be in the form of my husband or children or neighbor. It doesn't matter. You could be Lebanese, you could be Chinese, you could be Japanese, you could be Moroccan. It doesn't matter. As long as you're a Muslim, I have a special connection with you. I need to respect and make ikram towards you. Abdullah ibn Mubarak. Patta sallallahu sallallahu alayhi wa aziz in his collection narrates it from Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Man aqarra bi'ayni mu'minin aqarra allahu bi'aynihi yawm al-qiyamah. If a Muslim, he who puts coolness of eye into the eyes of a fellow Muslim, coolness of eye, it's an Arabic expression, qurrat aini, coolness of eye. Coolness of eye in English means nothing. Is your eyes cool? Yeah, my eyes are cool. Yeah, man, you're cool. That's not it. Coolness of eye is when you put surur, happiness, into the heart of a fellow Muslim. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, he who puts happiness in the heart of a fellow Muslim, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will put coolness in his eyes on the Day of Judgment. Because why are you respecting, why are you serving this particular human being? Because he believes in Allah. He carries the kalima, iman in his heart. He's your fellow Muslim. Stop judging people. Oh, he's, uh, uh, he's, this, <coughs> he's from this group. I don't give salams to those people. Astaghfirullah Is he a mu'min? Is he a believer? He's your brother. You need to work. You need to work. Your adab, your mu'amala towards him doesn't change. He might, some, he might have some funny ideas, and that's not what you call uh, in line with your thinking. It doesn't turn him into a kafir, that you, don't, you even cut your salam off from him. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a different hadith, Tamamu tahiyyati al-akhdhul bil-yad wal-musafahatu bil-yumna. Abu Umam al-Bahili radiallahu ta'ala an narrates this particular hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the completeness of salam To become kamil, mukammal, is when you hold the hand of your person that you're shaking, giving salams to. Handshake. And the one that is done with the right hand. When you love somebody, you say that you love that person for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go and shake his hands. In Western society, in Australia in particular, Europe, in America, exactly the same. When they shake hands, they shake hands like this, stiff hand. It's called proximity factor. Don't come close to me. And just hold the hand, just don't come close to me. I hate you. In Islam, shaking hands, musafaha, is completely different. Not this. A shaykh used to tell us, Rahmatullah when you shake the hand of a Muslim, you hold your hands up, not down, up. Right hand into right hand. Assalamu alaikum. Ya Habibi, kaif al I miss you. And I've seen it so many times. 
When at that level, people try to kiss his, each other's hands. Let me kiss your hand. Out of uh, the, especially ulama scholars. This is muhabba, tadahur. You're showing, displaying, not keep away from me. Musafaha is complete when the hands. In other words, you need to feel the pheromones. Not with the opposite gender, but that muhabba vibes has to pass through your hands. How many companions? Radwanullah ta'ala alayhim ajma'een. When they say, when we used to make musafaha with Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, his hands were so soft, so beautiful, it used to smell so much. How many of the politicians of today, na'udhu billah, I'm not comparing a politician with Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, sallam, na'udhu billah, uh, did they extend their warm hands to people? And people write about it in the newspaper, oh, Mr. Howard's hands were so nice and warm and gentle. Huh? Never. Na'udhu billah. Muhabba. Giving salam. Assalamu alaikum. Heart to heart. Come close to each other. Come close to each other. Assalamu alaikum. Giving salam is a sign of love. In Islam. Musafaha is even an advanced form of indication of love. Musafaha. First step is assalamu alaikum. It's the second step when you will make it complete. So there are many ways of putting happiness in the heart of a fellow Muslim. If you have more money, the other one has less money, give him something. Fulfill his need. If you don't have any money, you can put surur, happiness into a fellow Muslim's heart by being positive with your words, encourage him. And use smile. Even a smile is sadaqah, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. Tabassumuka sadaqah. To a fellow Muslim. Look at the relationship. When you see a fellow Muslim, I went to the, the, a recent function. Everybody seems to be like this. I said, in this place, there is only one sunnah left. Smile. I'm going around, I put my biggest smile on. She says, I'm, you know, inshallah, no fake. From the heart. Assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum. Before you know, everybody was hugging, <laughs> everybody is, is shaking hands. Just little sunnah. I don't know those people. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says one of the signs of qiyamah is when people give salams to only those they are acquainted with. They only give salams to their friends. They don't give any salams to any other Muslim. This is one of the signs of qiyamah. The worst possible scenario for a Muslim. We're living through that time. I know that person is a Muslim. I saw him at the mosque. He's walking towards me. He doesn't give salams to me because I am a what? Not Lebanese. He's Iraqi. I'm going to the shop. He sees me. I give salams deliberately. He's the owner. Salamu alaikum. He doesn't even notice. But I notice if an Iraqi comes in, Salamu alaikum ya habibi, kifak. What? I'm not part of the clan. Islam is the, what do you call, demarcated by a clan, the people that you know. This is that sign. So we need to break this habit. When you see that Muslim is Indonesian, go, Salamu alaikum brother, how are you? My name is Ahmed, what's yours? Nice to know you. Salamu alaikum brother. Again, hasana, reward, amazing. So that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِمُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ I swear by Allah who holds Allah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's ruh, his soul in his hand, his yad. None of you will enter Jannah until you believe. And none of you will be a true believer until you love one another for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And shall I inform you, which will increase that love amongst you, if sha'u salam. Spread salam. Salam is magic. What else Islam teaches us to increase this love towards each other? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encourages us to give hadiyah, gifts to one another, gifting. There is a very short and sweet hadith from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, her mother. She says, قَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ تَهَادَوْ تَزْدَادُوا حُبًّا When you give 
hadiyya towards each other, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase the love between your hearts. When somebody doesn't look at you, doesn't give you pay my, pay, pay my attention, and uh, okay, because he's busy, maybe he's got so many things in his mind, sometimes you think that mm, he's got something against me. All of a sudden, that person comes around with a smile and salam and gives you a little gift. Nice, something valuable. What will happen to those ice cold feelings in your heart towards that Muslim? Will perish, will diminish, because you think that mm, he cares for me. Yeah, sure. But we must give our gifts with adab, with in a, in a, what they call in an eloquent manner, with etiquette. Bro, huh? Yours. What's this? An iPhone. A gift? Yeah, have it. Look after it. Uh -uh, that's not the way to do it. You should never give that gift to a Muslim in a manner that is going to, na'udhu billah, humiliate him. Remember, maybe last week I mentioned during a qurban time, one rich person comes out of Eid al-Adha Salat from the mosque, he sees one of the mu'mineen, one of the good Muslims that he knows, but he's very faqir, he's very poor. He says, come with me. He says, help me out a little bit. They go to the uh, stock market where they sell the sheep, ram, you know. He says, choose one for me, please. He says, oh, you need some help, huh? Okay. He goes and chooses the best. He says, this is the best one. He says, okay, take it out. And he pays the money to the uh, owner. And he says, now my brother, take this. And inshallah, go home and take it. And inshallah, you sacrifice. And you do the qurban. And you enjoy it with your family. My gift to you. If you told him, bro, come here. I'm going to give you something. Come on, choose something. What would that person do? So he's already poor. He's already feeling a little bit, you know, disheartened. Uh, he will probably, because he doesn't want to hurt your feelings too, he'll probably go on, uh, probably go on what do you call, choose the least, the smallest. But because he didn't know anything about it, he made sure that he chose the best one. So without hurting the feeling of the fellow Muslim, with adab you must give. And you should not, also part of the adab, if somebody gave you a gift, you should not reciprocate it immediately. So if somebody gave you, uh, what do you call? Atar. Okay, sit on it. Some other day you give him something else. Don't say, Atar, here's a comb for you. I'm saying that, uh, they said, I'm not less than you. So you give me, I'm giving you two. Huh? I don't need your gift. Here, take it. That attitude is not on. So you need to be eloquent about it. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is asking us to give presents, gifts to each other. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم تهادوا فإن الهدية تضعف الحب وتذهب بغوائل الصدر. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, give gifts to each other, هدية presents to each other, because Giving gifts to each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase that love towards one another, in your hearts towards one another. And erase and eradicate all the ill feelings, hurts sometimes, misunderstandings a person might harbor in his heart, it will get rid of all those bad feelings. This is the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to give gifts all the time. And he used to be so generous about it. Amazing. If you're bakhil, if you're stingy, you'll never give anything to anybody. Yeah? You must give. Therefore, a Muslim has to love one another. Muslim have to gift one another. A Muslim has to give salams to one another. Some people refuse to accept gifts for two reasons. One is perhaps so-called righteous reason. The other one is more difficult reason. 
The righteous reason is, they say, I can't accept any hadiyya because hadiyya is given to salih people, good people. I'm not a good person. Don't give me any hadiyya. Well, this could be true, this could be not true as far as you're concerned, but hadiyya is sunnah, you must take it. And don't chuck this hadiyya somewhere, just accept it. Somebody brought something to your house. You don't eat or you don't like that particular gift, that particular food, for example. Don't say, I don't eat this man, I don't like this one. Oh, yeah, we don't eat this one. No, take it. Take it. Thank you for your gift. Jazakumullah khairu jazah. Thank you. You don't eat sweets, you're diabetic, for example. Or you don't eat hot chili stuff. Your uh, Pakistan never gave you hot curry. <laughs> you're an Egyptian, you don't touch any curry. It's hot. You take it. Thank you. Jazakumullah khairu jazah. After they've gone away, give this gift to somebody else. You can do this. Not a problem. But put that surur into the heart of the person who's giving that to you. Let them get that hasana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. The second, the difficult one is, they say, I can't afford to buy any gifts to that person. So if somebody gives me a gift, that means I am in obligation, under obligation to give gifts to that person again. So I'd rather not take any gifts, refuse the gifts, so I don't have to buy anything for him. This is not Islamic. Even dua for the brother of yours is a gift, the greatest gift. If you, can afford to, if you can't afford to buy anything for him, reciprocate this, return this gift to him, dua for him is a gift in itself. So don't be snobbish, don't be arrogant, don't be a sod. Accept the gift graciously and be thankful to that person. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a different hadith, he says, Man akramahu akhul muslim, he who makes ikram, ikram to a fellow muslim, gives a gift to a fellow muslim, fayaqbal karamatahu, he should immediately accept this ikram that a muslim has made. Immediately accepted. فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ كَرَامَةُ اللَّهِ For verily, this is actually coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That gift, who gave that gift to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who gave that ability to get this thing for you? Allah is the one who gave the gift to him, and therefore he gives it to you. It is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَا تَرُدُّوا عَلَى اللَّهِ كَرَامَتَهُ do not refuse the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to you via that servant of his. Command of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we say, when somebody says something, the most unusual, the most unexpected, sometimes a kid, sometimes even a drunk person can speak a word of hikmah, wisdom, to you and tell you the truth to your face, the most unexpected person. A Muslim's attitude should be, don't look at the person who's saying it, Look at, the, look at what is being said or who makes him say it to you. This is how a Muslim's attitude should be. So when somebody gives you a gift, you take that gift and thank to him because that gift in essence comes from who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the attitude. Man akrama akhahu fa innama yukrimullah. When a person makes ikram to a fellow Muslim, he has made ikram to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you give something to a Muslim as a gift, he has given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, man, astaghfirullah al-azim, bro, what are you talking about? How can you give anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah doesn't need anything. In a hadith Qudsi, Sahih hadith Qudsi, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa teaches us on the Day of Judgment, some people will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, say to that person, Oh my servant, I was sick. Did you come to visit me? They said, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen, how in the world are you going to become sick? He says, you're not a human being. How can, na'udhu billah, you subhanah, you are free from any fault, any defect, any imperfection. You are Allah, how can you be sick? How can I make you ziyarah, zi how can I visit you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, my such and such servant was sick. Muslim, your neighbor, 
your fellow Muslim, did you visit, visit him? Had you visited him, you would have visited me. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh my servant, I was hungry. Did you feed me? Astaghfirullah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not eat, does not sleep, does not drink. He's not like us. He's not in need of anything. Correct? Allah samad. Allah does not need anything. Therefore, the person says, Ya Rabbil Alameen, how? It's impossible. How could I ever feed you? You are Rabbil Alameen. You are not in need of anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, when my servant, your neighbor, your Muslim brother that you know of was hungry, have you fed him? Have you given him some ikram in the form of presents sometimes? Have you given this to that person? If you did, you would have fed me. Subhanallah. So when Rasulullah says, Man akrama akhahu, fa innama yukrimullah. He who gives makes ikram to his fellow Muslim brother, he's actually making ikram to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And vice versa. When you receive something from a brother of yours, it is actually an ikram of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. The word tahadaw, as in the first hadith, is a command. It is a verb of musharaka. You must do it together. It is not one-sided gift. When somebody gives you a gift, you return that gift back to him. Not that that, that with another gift. The attitude of Rabbana, Rabbana, Rabbana, all for me, all for me, attitude is despicable in Islam, not encouraged. If you give somebody constantly gifts and that person never reciprocates, that person is suffering from bukhul. He is stingy. He, is an explo he exploits you. That is an absolutely wrong attitude of a Muslim. My sister doesn't give me any gifts. My dad, my mother never gives me any gifts. I gave them so many things, but they never even buy me a single thing. Yeah, your parents, your sister, your brother, your father is doing the wrong thing. But you should continue giving gifts. And you should teach them perhaps through this ahadith that they should also give gifts to you. Such a beautiful religion. And look at the social interaction. Look at the mu'amala. Ad-deen al-mu'amala, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says. It's your behavior. In this society where everybody loves each other, everybody hugs each other, there is deep compassion, care, sacrifice for one another. And people give gifts to each other. Will there be any hatred? Will there be any family feuds? Will there be any hasad? Will there be any envy, jealousy? Definitely not. The word karama is something that we use sometimes in aqidah in relation to awliyaullah, the walis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a wondrous act happens out of standard acts, something that is above natural, supernatural act happens out of the norm, a wondrous act happened in the hands of a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We call this karama. In the Quran there are many references. About Maryam alayhi salam. When a caretaker, Zakaria came into the room in the middle of winter, cold, in a barren land, barren area in Bethlehem. She was eating Grapes, fresh fruit. They said, where did you get this from? He said, it is ikram from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Karama. The human wazir, minister of Sulaiman alayhi salam, when he asked his so-called council, who will bring the throne of Sheba, queen of Sheba, to me? One of the jinn, not a human being. He said, oh, before you get up from your 
a seat before you come to here, and I will bring it to you. Mm. How about you? I'll do this. And the human being, the human one, he said, I will bring it to you in a blink of an eye. How could a human being can do this? This is called karama. Karama happens in the hands of a mu'min, a believer, a Muslim. Wondrous act. The word karama, I want to tie it with the word ikram and karama. Remember, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Man akramahu akhul muslim, he who makes ikram to his fellow muslim, falyaqbal karamatahu. He must immediately accept his karama. Not the karama that we've been talking about, about the wondrous act, but this karama is the karama of gift. When we say somebody's kareem, accept his generosity, if you like. When anything that is out of ordinary happens in the hands of a Nabi, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any of the Anbiya, any of the Rusul, it's called Mu'ajiza. But when a wondrous act happens in the hands of a pious, righteous Muslim, this is called Karama. And when something happens in the hands of a Fasiq, Fajr, Kafir, disbeliever, this is called Istidraj. Istidraj. This is something that can happen to anybody. But when it happens in the hands of a believing mu'min, a righteous Muslim, it is a karama because it is a karama given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's showing to other people. An ability. Because no karama, the source of every karam is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. al kareem is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody on their own accord could ever do anything. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. Nobody will be able to move an atom on their own. Make an atom move. Have the strength to move an atom. Have any strength or power except that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. There is no might, there is no power except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a Muslim does not harbor muhabba, love towards one another, نعوذ بالله, he harbors the opposite. He does not like Muslims. He hates Muslims. He cheats Muslims. He takes a fellow Muslim for a ride. And he doesn't care what happens to the Muslims. There is a warning from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Umama radiallahu an again narrates his hadith from Ibn Majah, Nasai, Tabarani, Muslim. In Muwatta of Imam Malik and also in the مسند of أحمد بن حنبل قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من اقتطع حقا امرأة مسلم بيمينه فقد أوجب الله لهم النار وحرم عليه الجنة فقال رجل يا رسول الله وإن كان شيئا يسيرا قال صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن كان قَضِيبًا مِنْ أَرَاكِ صدق رسول الله فيما قال أو كما قال He who takes the right of a fellow Muslim unjustly, unfairly, explodes, cheats, steals from him without his rida, without his giving with his own heart he exploits that Muslim, takes advantage of that particular Muslim. And when he does this, he does it with yameen, oath. For example, you lost your laptop. And you saw it with a fellow Muslim. He said, that's my laptop. He said, no, it's not. It's mine. I lost it last week. No, it's not. It's mine. Wallah, it's mine. The guy makes yameen. 
And you know that it has all your handwritten marks on it with a lot of a certain stickers that you have on it. Uh -uh. He found the, uh, what do you call, the password and he reformatted the whole thing, he's using it. And he says, Wallahi, it's his. He makes zameen for it. What will happen when a Muslim lies to a Muslim and cheats his right in a marketplace? He's selling your product. He's selling you a furniture. He's selling you a stolen good and defective good. And he says, Wallahi, this is perfect. And he gets the top money from you for it. Whether it be a commodity, whether it be a service, whatever it is in a business transaction. And he says, Wallahi, Allah is my witness. He makes yameen, takes an oath, and he cheats you. What will happen to such Muslim? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَقَدْ أَوْجَبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ النَّارِ وَحَرَّمَ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make Jahannam, the fire of Jahannam, wajib for him. He will definitely enter Jahannam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make Jannah haram for him. Haram for him. Ya Latif. Somebody said, Ya Rasulullah, what if the thing that we made yameen for, the thing that we took off that person is something negligible, something small? Shay'an yasira. In kana shay'an yasira. Something that is simple, you know, not worthy of anything. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Wa in kana qadiban min ara. Even if the thing that you have taken from your brother is a little twig of miswak. That Iraq is a root of a tree where they make miswak from. There's so many. Anybody can get it. Dirty. It's just little matchstick even. If you understand. Even matchstick. If you took from a fellow Muslim and you said you even made yameen for it. You made Allah as a witness to your lie, to your cheating. Jahannam will become wajib for you, and Jahannam will become haram for you. You go and cheat anything you want. Remember lifestyles we talked about? You can do anything you want. Our Sheikh used to tell us those, some people, professional liars, in certain mahkama entrances waiting. In Turkey, he says, I came across these people. They're waiting, and you've got a case coming up, but you don't have much enough witnesses to your case. And you're in the right or wrong, doesn't matter. And the guy says, bro, uncle, aunt, you look a bit troubled. Are you looking for a uh, witness? You tell me what to say, I'll say it for you. 10 bucks. That's a full-time job. Lying and giving evidence in the court falsely. Giving evidence, false evidence against a Muslim is one of the kabair, one of the kabira, one of the major, major, major sins. You can ruin a person's life by giving evidence, false evidence. Qala wa in kana qadiba min Iraq. Even that thing is so negligible, so small, like toothpick, nothing. Therefore, under no circumstances, a Muslim ever hurt a Muslim in any way, in any shape or manner. Even Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, do not joke with a Muslim. If that joke is going to hurt him, break his heart. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Subhanallah. A shaykh used to tell us, he says, one day Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood up in front of Kaaba. He says, Oh Kaaba, al mukarrama al musharrafa You are so great in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are so great, noble in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I swear by Allah, I swear by Allah, that the heart of a mu'min, a believer, is more beloved to you than to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than you. Is more valuable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How could you hurt a fellow Muslim? 
playing prank jokes on him. But if your relationship with him is as such that he doesn't hold any grudges and, you know, it's just mild joking, it's okay. No problem. But if the person is one of those persons who takes everything seriously, and if you say to him, your mother's dead, he also dies, in the mother is not dead. Yeah? What kind of a joke is this man? You should never joke with such people. You need to be very careful because it's going to hurt them. Especially with our elderly. What if you did hurt people in the past? You fall into this category. One form or another, you exploited, you bullied, you hurt a fellow Muslim in the society. Of your relatives, of your cousins, of your schoolmates, even non-Muslims. What do you have to do? We must first ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make tawbah. And we must seek these people and ask for forgiveness. If you could not, you're in trouble. If they don't forgive you, you're in trouble. By hook or crook, you must make sure that they forgive you. Bribe them. Buy them a Mercedes. One day, it is said about Abu Hanifa, Rahimullah, he was teaching some children perhaps in the classroom, one of them was very naughty. He gently grabbed the ear of one of the students, young boys, and pulled a little bit. Just the boy looked at him and says, Ya Shaykh, ittaqullah, fear Allah, don't you know that there is day of judgment? I'm going to get my haqq from you. <laughs> Abu Hanifa fainted, literally fainted. When he came to his sense, he says, bring him to me, bring him to me, quick. It is not him who said it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it to say, make him say it to me, to teach me a lesson. He says, come here, boy. What's your name, Ahmed? Okay. He says, I pulled your ear, right? He says, yes. Please, come and pull my ear. I don't want to answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the day of judgment. You come and pull my ear. He says, all right. He comes and grabs the sheikh's ear. He's only a child maybe seven, eight years old, he pulls a little bit. The sheikh says, that's not enough, I pulled it harder. He says, I'm not silly, I'm not stupid. He says, I don't, wanna, I don't, want, to give you, I mean, I don't want you to claim your haqq on me on the day of judgment. Maybe jokingly, we say these things, whether true or not, I don't even know, we cannot verify it. However, the haqq and hukuk of ibad is so important that a Muslim has to be absolutely Careful, absolutely careful. If your attitude towards Muslims is one of those of carefree, you don't care. As long as you keep on, you know, protecting your own nafsul ammara, and you keep on wanting everything, and you confiscate, you bully, you hurt with your words and deeds, what will happen to you on the day of judgment? Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam says in one sahih hadith, he says, "Who's a bankrupt person? Who's a bankrupt person?" They said, Ya Rasulullah, a bankrupt person is a person who has lost his capital in a business venture. He lost all the capital that he puts in the business, he lost it. He is a bankrupt person, declares bankruptcy. He can't do business for five years or ten years or whatever the case is. And all the debtors cannot claim anything or creditors cannot claim anything. Sure? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, that's your definition of a bankrupt person. Real bankruptcy, real bankrupt person is... Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, on the day of judgment, when a Muslim comes before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with billions and trillions and trillions of rewards, hasana, his hasana is so much and his sins are so little. As a result, malaika congratulate him. They escort him towards Jannah. Please come, ahlan wa sahlan. You, this is your place. All of a sudden while he's going, he hears people screaming behind him. Oh, Sheikh Mahmoud! Sheikh Mahmoud! Oh, her brothers are coming to congratulate me. I, I turn around. They're all running towards you. By the thousands. Whoa, big crowd too, huh? They say, where are you going? I'm going to Jannah, mate. No way, Jose. You finish your mahkamah court with Allah. Allah forgave you for the things that he's done towards him. But how about us? We never forgave you. 
You had the upper hand. You could hurt us with your words and deeds. And you did. And I never forgave you for this. If the guy says, okay, I mean, Sheikh Mahmoud says, uh, what do you want? I can't give you any money. Okay, say those things to me. He said, nah, not those things. The only medium of exchange, currency here, is hasana. He says, I want some hasana of yours. Look, I'm in the red at the moment. I don't want to go to Jahannam. He says, all right, everybody gets into a queue. A couple of billion people. Yeah? What the first one wants, uh, how much do you want for your one time, one time I, called you, I, I called you, what do you call, chicken. I swear to him, I called him chicken. Yellow belly. And he was hurt. Yeah? He says, give me more. Give me more. One, two, three. No. Give me more. Until I am in the black. The guy took half of your hasanat. The next guy. Uh, remember, you hurt my finger once. And you never said sorry, and I never forgave you. Or you took my pencil, you took my this, you took my this, you took my money. You cheated, remember? You hurt my feelings, I never forgave you. I want my haq. Okay, how much do you want? I'm in the red, I want to be in black. My hasana should be more than my sins now. He takes the other half, or other quarter. Before long, this guy who had so much hasana becomes absolutely bankrupt. There is nothing left. Hold on. And the number of people waiting in the queue is still, you cannot see the end of it. The guy says, I want my haq. And you say to him, get lost. I haven't got anything to give you. I'm finished. No more hasana. And he says, listen, I don't need any hasana. I can do it this way. I give you all my sins to you so that I'm free from sins. I've got my little hasana to take me to Jannah. So he passes downloads into your account all his debts, all his sins into you. So what happens now? Everybody in the queue until the end gives you sins so much so that your sins end up being bigger than the Hassanat started with. You have huge mountains of sins. Guess what happens then? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this person is bankrupt. The true bankruptcy is this one. The malaika of Jannah, the ones who are escorting him, is watching in astonishment. They <laughs> go away from him, and the, people, the malaika of Jahannam, hellfire, will come and get him. He says, excuse me, sir, you're under arrest. Come to Jahannam now. Hukuk al-ibad is so important. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to take bay'ah from the companions. They used to swear allegiance to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the items, besides not committing shirk and not killing their children and what have you, is not to ask for any favor, anything from anybody. Because if that person hold it against you on the day of judgment and did not forgive you afterwards, you're in trouble. The companions also gave promise to this. So much so amongst them, some of them, if they are on top of the camel walking, they drop their little whip or little stick, they you know, hit the uh, camel, fit the ca camel to move, uh, move with, they will never ask anybody to, what do you call, please, can you give me that stick, bro? They will put the uh, camel down, dismount, it's a huge process, and they will pick it up and they get onto their camel because they said, we promised the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not, not to ask for any favors from anybody. Any favors to anybody. That's why as Muslims, when we depart from each other, he said, please brother, make your haq halal to me. He says, okay brother, my haq halal is to you. Khalas, finished. If you haven't, on the day of judgment, the guy is going to come around and says, Shaykh Mahmood, I want my haq. What's your haq, bro? I don't even know you. I never met you. He says, you did. It was July the 17th, 1978, in Cole Supermarket. You were going and coming out, and there was no uh, automatic doors at that time. So I opened the door for you because your both hands were full with groceries. He says, for that, I want my haq. He says, I can't even remember, wallahi. But the picture comes and you see. He says, I did a favor to you, I want my haq. I want my right. This is how sensitive, how perfect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's scales are on the Day of Judgment. Two mahkamah, one with Allah, one with human beings. 
Don't you want to have such a beautiful life with muhabba, with love, with salam, with ikram, with presence, where you in the hearts of people, they come and ask you, please, please forgive us. Please forgive us. Because you have so much haq on us. Our parents have so much haq on us. Our teachers have so much haq on us. We can never repay them, no matter what we do. But we can always try our best. But with the hukuk of normal people, fellow Muslims around us, we need to be extra careful. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam therefore tells us as the first door, you must make tawbah and you must continue to make istighfar. You feel anxiety attacks, you have panic attacks, several disorders, depression. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives you the cure. Qala Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I'm going to finish it up inshallah in five minutes. Man akthara min al istighfari, he who makes lots of istighfar. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Please, Ya Rabbi, forgive me. I've done so many wrong things. Constantly asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. Hundred times a day, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do it. Hundred times, minimum. Astaghfirullah. Oh Allah, please forgive me. Oh Allah, please forgive me. There are so many sins I make without even realizing. I don't see it, but I, you know, with my eyes, with my ears, with my tongue, with my words, with my attitude, with my relationship with my parents, I make lots of sins, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Rahman Rahman, please forgive me. Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Man akthara min al-istighfari. Ja'ala Allahu Azza wa Jal lahu min kulli hammin faraja. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, what, do, what will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do to you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you into expansion and opening. When you are depressed, when you're anxious, as if the whole constriction of your heart, you feel that you are drowning. <sighs> Amazing breather, as they say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open your heart. From qab to the bust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open your heart that you will feel you'll begin to feel like a human being. No more anxiety, no more depression, no more concerns. وَمِن كُلِّ ضِيقٍ مَخْرَجًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you, give you, show you an exit from all corners, all, you know, you're cornered, you are in a situation, tight spot, that you cannot get out. Allah will open up an opening for you. Yeah, promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَرَزَقَهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ And shall give you rizq, sustenance, from the places that you think that it was not possible. You never even took that into consideration. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. Some people, they feel so terrible some mornings because they've got seven bills in one go. Insurance, water bill, other utility, other utility, my kids' expenses, their kids' expenses. You look at your bank account, you, got, you don't even have 25% of it. And you're not, everybody's there, they keep, keep, uh, keep calling you, when are you going to pay, when are you going to pay? Such a stress on you. What are you going to do? But if you keep on starting astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, Allah will bring your rizq to you quicker. Will give you rizq from the places that you thought it was not possible. I always say this, this particular story that brings tears to my eyes. I opened up a business of my profession somewhere on Sydney Road once, before I was an imam. My beloved wife asked me to bring milk home and bread, sliced bread. She doesn't know anything about it. I don't have enough money to buy bread and milk for my kids, for my family. I don't get any money from the government. This is just a business. In business, anything can happen. Yeah? Subhanallah. I said, Ya Rabbi, what am I going to do? I kept on saying, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. I said, Ya Rabbi, I put my hands up. There is one particular dua, I also read that. I'm not going to tell you. A secret one. Yeah. What am I going to do? I'm not going to ask anybody for money. It's not my habit to ask people for handouts. 
Subhanallah, I don't have money to buy basic necessity for my family. Subhanallah, why, why, why I'm looking at my phone book. They're one of those with index numbers. You know, A, B, C, D, one, two, three, whatever it is. Then I saw an envelope that I always see, but it's an envelope. It has some official regalia on it, I mean stamp on it. It says, oh, Melbourne Institute of something, something. I said, subhanAllah. I opened up, not expecting anything. It's a check. Six and a half thousand dollars. Written to me. And the dated four and a half years ago. Because I was doing lots of work, they must have sent it in the mail. I put it in there, I forgot about the, the, the check. Six and a half thousand dollars. I begin to shake. So I, I'm crying. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me a check. Because I only turn to him. Not anybody else. The bank is downstairs. Immediately I went to the bank. Usually checks expire after six months. They don't have to honor their check, what do you call? Their check if you haven't given it for six months, correct? Or 12 months, whatever the case is. So I went in. I gave it to the girl, a cashier. I said, excuse me, can you check if this check is okay? He says, yeah. I'm even more shaking this time. I said, can I cash it now? He says, yeah, but it'll cost you 10 bucks. I said, get 10 bucks out of it. <laughs> Give me the rest. I came home crying, cannot help. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give this وَرَزَقَهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ We'll test you sometimes. Difficulty, where do you turn to? Do you resort to stealing? Fraud? Lie? And cheating the system? Or begging? When you open the door of begging, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah will open many restrictions for you from other human beings. Yeah, ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Your ham, your gham, everything will be moved. But you need to do it on a regular basis, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, make us good Muslims. Make us responsible Muslims. Make us Muslims who care and love fellow Muslims, regardless of their background, regardless of their jama'ah, regardless of who they are who embrace all Muslims because they share La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Because they are the ummah of our beloved Nabi Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to instill this love and muhabba of our Muslim community in the hearts of our children. Make them caring, sharing, loving Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to put the love of Islam, love of Allah, love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, above every other love. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take this selfishness out of our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take this indifference, this ghafla, heedlessness away from our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah allow us to live as a muttaqi Muslim, a muhsin Muslim, a Muslim of karama, a Muslim who makes ikram to others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do not allow any of anybody's haqq to come upon us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to die in a state where he's pleased with us. And all the human beings are also pleased with us, around us. Mawlana Jalaluddin al-Rumi, rahimahullah, says in his Mathnawi, one particular couplet, he says, when you come into this world, you are crying. Probably you understood what this dunya is about and you're crying. But everybody around you, your parents, your grandparents, everybody's smiling. We've got a son, we've got a daughter. Yeah? He says, you should live such a life in your life as a Muslim, a muttaqi Muslim, a person of husn al-khuluq and akhlaq and taqwa, as such that everybody loves you. When you die in your deathbed, you are the only one who's smiling. Big smiles, laughing. Ila Rafiq al-A'la to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're going to from this sijin coming out where everybody cries. This is the life of a Muslim. You should aim for this. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the Muslimin, inshaAllah. True Ummah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma aslih ummata Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma arham ummata Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma tajawaz an ummati Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ja'alna min ummati Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma arham ummata Muhammadin rahmatan aamma. Ya arhaman rahimin. Ya dhal jalali wa ikram. Ya quddus ya salam. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilahe illa ant. Wahtaka la sharika lak. Nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العظيم لله تعالى الفاتحة